Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. We have a delicious book for you. It's Dara Goldstein's new cookbook. It's called Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking. What a wonderful book to cook some fabulous recipes for your loved ones and friends. Dara, welcome to Anderson's in Naperville. I am so happy to be here, Becky. Well, it's, and I know you have a history, but, and you're going to be at our Downers Grove store tonight, but I'm so glad you stopped in for, the, for, for this interview. But tell us a little bit about your history in, in the western suburbs of Chicago. Well, when I was 12 years old, we moved to Downers Grove from Pittsburgh. My father had gotten a job at Nalco Chemical Corporation. And suddenly I was in the Midwest and it seemed like everyone spoke a slightly different language or at least different pronunciation. But that feels as though it was the greatest adjustment I had to make. I really loved Downers Grove High School okay. South. I was very into, you know, going to the football games on Friday nights yeah, and sure, things sure, like that. Right? It was a very uh, sort of heartland of America yeah. experience. Yeah. Now you're here for your new cookbook, and I want to tell you this is the most stunning, gorgeous cookbooks I've seen in a long while. It is absolutely beautiful, fire and ice. It is just, it's just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. So I want to know, it's all about classic Nordic cooking, and this is your eighth book, but your fifth cookbook, I think, something like that, right? Something yeah? like, like that, that. Right? yeah, right? something like right. that. But tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the book's been out you know, for three weeks. three weeks now. Yes. So, so what is the reaction of everything? And, and tell us where the impetus or the seeds or, or I guess the, the ingredients started to grow for, for this wonderful Those are cooking. lots of questions in one yes, breath. That's right. um, yeah. the, the response has been really wonderful. Yeah. I hadn't written a cookbook for about 20 years and was really longing to get back into the kitchen. I've been writing a lot about food and that entailed sitting at the computer and I missed the sensuality sure. of it and my hands and the ingredients. But I also started thinking about my own life and in 1972 I went to Finland. I had been trying to get into the Soviet Union to study Russian and couldn't get in and I thought I need to go someplace else that's cold with yeah. a long winter and right. snow. So I studied there and I was sort of blown away by Scandinavia, although the Swedes don't really consider Finland part of Scandinavia, yes, but right. I've in included yeah, it. Sure. And then the first year my husband and I were married, again, trying to get to the Soviet Union, my visa was denied. And so we lived in Stockholm our first year. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I, I have quite a, a history and then sure. I did some work for the Norwegian Ministry of Culture. And then I got to know Denmark a little bit too. Yeah, right. Because, you know, this is all about, you know, you're talking about Nordic cooking. So this is not just what people think of Scandinavian or Scandinavia. They think of Norway and Sweden. But you have Denmark and Finland and basically those four countries, which there's wonderful sections within the book on each of these countries. Too. Yeah, the, so, the cultural yeah. history of yeah. the places and the culinary history is yeah. what always is most enthralling to me. Yeah. And I love the photography in this. So tell us a little bit about the photographer because this is not your average cookbook. This has beautiful writing that you do when you describe each country, but also the cooking itself. And within each recipe, you put so much description and history and it, it adds so much more to your culinary experience when you're preparing this dish, but also you know, serving it to someone. <laughs> Thank you for all the praise, Becky. I'm yeah. glad that you're enjoying no. it. Well, to me, uh, you can make a recipe and it tastes delicious, right, but it sure. always has so much more resonance if you know a little bit about the history or if you know about the author's experience, like where he or she first tasted the dish. Right. So I wanted to add that personal history, but also some uh, information that might be really useful to readers so they'd understand more about the genesis right, of it. Right, right. And there are some beautiful quotes from some well-known <laughs> chefs, and I love Ruth Reichel's uh -oh. quote. Um, it makes you want to travel and cook more. Yeah. And isn't that what a good cookbook should do anyway? I think so, yeah, but actually. that's because I love to travel. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're, you're talking about cuisine and, and talking about a culture or a land or anything, why is cooking traditional food so important for us to understand each other, do you think? I think it's important because food uh, is one very deep way and very immediate way to express culture. 
So if you travel and you don't understand a language, you can still engage with the culture right. through taste and through smells and through seeing how foods are eaten, you know, whether you use your hands or chopsticks or forks, how tables are set, mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of beverage beverages there are. Right. So it all comes together and I think really is very expressive. Yeah. So tell us about the title, Fire and Ice. <laughs> well, that was funny because uh, this title just came to me. I was thinking about cold places, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking about getting warm. So it was Fire and Ice, and I thought it sounded good. And initially the publisher said, we're not sure because there's the song of ice and fire from Game of Thrones. That's right. Well, that's, that's what you do think of <laughs> exactly. a little bit. Exactly. Because winter is coming, or, you know, as they say, right? <laughs> and they uh, were initially concerned that if people Googled the book or tried to find it, they'd come up with Game of Thrones. And I said, well, that could be a very good marketing tool. Oh, that's true. Tool. That's true. It could work for so, your advantage uh, there. That's where it yeah. came from. And yeah. thinking about uh, the uh, fire sparkles and that's ice right. shimmers. Yeah. So people think about the north as very dark. But for me, it's also a place of radiance and a oh, place of sure. light. Yeah. Especially in the summertime when it stays light so yeah. late and it's so beautiful. So this is traditional Nordic cooking. You know, this isn't, um, you know, so many cookbooks that are coming out. It's the new innovative stuff that, that chefs are creating. And, and they, they're hard to cook at home where this is not that kind of yeah. cookbook. I think of it as sort of a corrective to the whole new mm -hmm. Nordic movement, yeah. which... Uh, these chefs are brilliant and they write wonderful books, but it isn't, people aren't necessarily yeah. going out and picking lichen and eating yeah. the lichen, although the Sami uh, yeah. herders, reindeer herders used to do that in the past. Yeah. But it's really what people eat at home and it includes a lot of forage foods, mm -hmm. particularly mushrooms and berries. That's right. a cultural institution in um, late spring and late summer and early fall to go out and gather these things. Mm -hmm. But mostly it, it's what you would do if you were sitting down with your family at dinner. And the recipes are quite simple because my life is busy as everyone's oh, life sure, is now. Sure. And in my early cookbooks, the recipes could take days because <laughs> I wanted everything to be just so. Right. And now I think they're delicious, but they're not so labor intensive. Right. And there's a lot of seasonality to the cookbook, too. Yes. And so it's, it's sort of like the, the local food movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, choosing things that are, that are seasonal, that are yeah. in your area, too. The thing yeah. that's so interesting about immersing myself in Nordic food was to really experience the transformations in mm -hmm. that seasonality because I think of the food that is plucked from the earth or that grows in the very short uh, growing season sure. in the summer, mm -hmm. but then you start working it through curing it or smoking it or brining it or drying it because right. you have this very long winter coming mm -hmm. and the flavor intensifies and you have a whole other spectrum right. of flavors. Right. So, you know, there are a lot of stereotypes about Scandinavian cooking or Nordic cooking, you know, and, and you dispel a lot of that with this book. So tell, tell us a little bit about some of those. And I, there's the obvious ones, but what other ones did you want to dispel by making this book? Well, I was just in Minneapolis and everyone came up to me and said, is there Lutfisk in the, in the book? And I said, you know, I thought very hard about that because it's sort of the quintessential yeah. food that everyone thinks of mm -hmm. in relation to Scandinavian cooking. But the thing is, if you love lutefisk, you'll have your mother's recipe, so you don't need that's mine. Right. <laughs> well, that's like my dad said, his aunt would always make it, you know, and then they would they would pre pretty much eat it and then throw it away, you know, take a couple of bites. Yeah, so it was the symbolic, it was the ritual aspect that's right. of it. That's right, it's the ritual, it's not and the taste. And I would say another thing is that, um, you know, it might be a lot of potatoes or heavy bland food, but potatoes weren't really widespread until the 19th century. People were eating whole grains, which is another way in which this book resonates with right. the way we're thinking about eating. A lot of barley, a lot of rye, and there's a beautiful recipe for rye porridge oh, in the book that. That, that you put in at night, say at 11 o'clock at night, mix it with some water, obviously, so mm -hmm. that the grains will soften and add some dried cranberries. And in the morning, your porridge is ready and you don't need any sugar. Yeah. I have a terrible sweet tooth, but the cranberries really? sweeten oh, it. Oh, okay. I'm so making really that one. Good. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
So the design of this book, how, how much did you have, because Ten Speed is, the publisher is producing such beautiful, beautiful cookbooks. Ten Speed's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So we had a lot of discussions about what my vision for the mm -hmm. book was, and there were a lot of different mock-ups of things. And um, the initial cover, since you asked about it, yeah. was uh, a, a fully baked pike. Okay. There's a recipe for baked pike mm -hmm. in the book, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever looked at a pike up close and <laughs> personal. <laughs> they are really scary. They're scary with all their yeah, teeth. Yeah, they're, they're, ter they're almost like sharks in some yeah. people's yeah. Uh, yeah. world. So I didn't think it was an inviting cover, yeah. but it was intriguing. Yeah. And it made me think that we should do something that was out there. And, and then the designer, Betsy Stromberg, who's just extraordinarily talented, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thought, well, maybe we can go without food right. and have a cover that uh, evokes the textiles that you find in Scandinavia. Yeah. So I, this is a quote from you, and it's short, and I want you to finish it because there's more. My interest in food is not just gustatory. <laughs> It it's is such not a just wonder, gustatory. It's such a okay. great word, that word. So, so tell us about that, because really eating is just not about your taste buds. There's so much more, right? Obviously, the deliciousness is the most important thing. And if I don't have something delicious, I, I am rather unhappy. Yeah. So food and taste are primary. But I feel that the taste is enhanced if mm -hmm. you understand everything that underlies it. For instance, who made it? Where did the ingredients come right. from? Why were they chosen? How did a tropical spice like cardamom which grows oh, in India, yeah. make its way into Scandinavian baked goods. Yeah. What is the story there? Yeah. So once you start, and that is more of the puzzle, mm -hmm. so once you start putting together those pieces, it's a, a journey that you can take even at your desk. I mean, even sure. better to go and travel, right, but right. Um, yeah. it becomes very exciting and I think more meaningful once you... Uh, look into foods in depth. Yeah, right. And, and you know, you're talking about the Nordic people, you know, how, what was, you, after spending so much time there, what is their philosophy towards food? And, and what can we learn from, from these four countries about the way they approach food and, and, and their cuisine? I mean, I think sometimes in America, we, we go for the bland and we don't take the time to really create food and the experiences that other countries do. Yeah, I think there's still a real closeness to nature. I mean, obviously I'm speaking in generalizations, sure, sure. but there's a way in which um, just about everyone, particularly in um, Finland and Sweden, needs to go out into nature and connect with it and gather the berries, the mushrooms that I talked about, but even little spruce shoots that you can mix with salt or infuse oil with, or juniper berries, oh, which are good. wonderful this time of year. So I think it is a sense of living with the seasons because the seasons mm -hmm. are so extreme there. Yeah. And the, the differences in light, yeah. which also affect the, the mood and oh, the, for sure. the need for to sure. go Oh, for sure, when there's outside. more darkness, but also once you reach, you know, June 22nd, and you have midsummer, mid which yeah. is so wonderful. Um, you know, I have Swedish relatives, and, and going over in Utebar and, and going there and visiting them and, and tasting and going to the Fiskachuk and picking out the cod and going back. And, but I've never tasted cod like that. And you have this recipe in the book, and the potatoes, just so simple. You know, it's buttered steamed potatoes. Oh, but there's yeah. something, it was like I had. I had never had potatoes before until I yeah. had that. And to have the cod and the way it was right with the fresh horseradish, mm -hmm. it was just, wow. And then the pickled herring that my, <laughs> that make, my cousin <laughs> made, it was just incredible. And, and knowing that, you know, that these things are, you've never had this taste before, but they were simple. They're, they're making, simple. And yeah. I think, again, it's because the food is so fresh. Mm -hmm. If you think about Scandinavia and all of its coastline. I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot of fish. It can get to market very quickly. We live in the Berkshires in western mm -hmm. Massachusetts and we're four hours from the coast. Uh -huh. So yeah. there's no way we're going to get that kind of achingly fresh fish. Right. Um, so yes, tasting fish that good is a revelation. Yeah, it really is. So you, where, did, where did your interest and love of food begin? How old were you, would you think? 
I was really little. I yeah. often talk to my sister about this because she's a brilliant seamstress. And she can take a scrap and turn it into a Cinderella gown. And if I pick up a needle, I prick my finger, I start sure, bleeding, yeah. I just can't do it. But I was drawn to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So from a very early age, I was always wanting to play in it. But I think one of the things that really um, helped form me was we grew up in Pittsburgh until we moved here. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Pittsburgh, they have this Cathedral of Learning that's filled with different nationality rooms. Mm -hmm. And in my childhood, I don't think they're doing it any longer, but you could go in at Christmas. And oh. each room was decorated with all of the seasonal ornaments and decorations, right, right. and they had samples. And oh, the Swedish oh, room okay. had this beautiful fresco of the three wise men mm -hmm. But they were dressed like these very dapper cavaliers. Oh, you know, it was, well, yeah, it was just wonderful. Yeah. And they handed out pepperkakor, the gingerbread sure, cookies. Right. So I think there was something about experiencing the food and the culture. Sure. And it just Along with clicked. the celebration that yes. all goes together. So earlier this year, you published another book called The Oxford Companion Guide to Sugar, Sugar and, and Sweets. Sweets. So tell us a little about that, because it's, it's quite a volume. I think it's 900 pages wow. or 931, but I didn't write that by myself. Uh, there were 265 contributors, and I was the editor-in-chief, so I conceptualized and orchestrated, sure. and I wrote a few of the entries. But uh, I, I can't claim it entirely for uh, my own. But it's really, again, a new way of looking at this food stuff, which is currently being anathematized yes, sugar yeah. the worst thing you could ever consider ingesting but in fact there is this enormously rich history which mm -hmm. is really the history of human desire and our survival our need to find source of energy uh, sure. in ripe berries and other foods but then so many dark things with slavery and uh, colonialism so looking at both the delights that sugar has brought throughout history, but also the, the darkness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> what that craving for something sweet. Yes. Right? Um, there you are a professor of Russian yes. at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And, and you've written extensively on Russian cuisine. I have. And so and you've consulted with international groups on how food can be used to promote you know, tolerance and diversity and that sort of thing. But the one thing I loved when I read your bio, you were Stolichnaya's Vodka's <laughs> U.S. spokesman. So tell us something about all your all your love of Russia and Russian oh. cuisine and also being a professor. Of okay, food. that was actually in 1983, and it was very unexpected. So I published my first cookbook, which was A Taste of Russia, and it's still in print. Uh, in okay. 1983, mm -hmm. and I was asked to represent Stoli, which had just been introduced into the United States. Oh, okay. But yeah. what was so stressful about it was mm -hmm. not going around showing people how to toss that vodka, which I did very easily <laughs> in those years. <laughs> not quite as good as I used to yeah, be. Sure. But it was imported by PepsiCo, and oh, I wasn't allowed okay. to reveal that a communist product was being sold by PepsiCo. Oh, how interesting. So I would have to sort of pussyfoot sure, around sure. that. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting. You know, at the end of this book, that's great because you put the sources of where to find some of the ingredients within the recipes, but also that metric conversion, which is, yes. you know, which is we just never got into metric here in the United States. No, so, and we discussed yeah. having the metric equivalents in the recipes yeah, themselves, sure. and we originally had them there. And then we looked at the page, and the book is so clean and spare and minimalist sure. in its design that it somehow looked too busy, so then we yeah. took yeah. it out. You know, I, I'm talking about being a professor at Williams, and do you use food in your classes when you teach? And, and how yeah. do you use it to incorporate it? Because I know you're, you love Russian poetry, but, mm -hmm. but talk about how do you incorporate food and, and, and the love of that of different cuisines into I actually am teaching. only teaching courses relating to food now. Oh, okay. Williams has been quite wonderful wow. to me and allowed me to sure. evolve in my teaching. So I teach a course in the sociology department mm -hmm. on food and society, oh, okay. which is really an introduction to food studies. Mm -hmm. And the students at the end of the course, one of the requirements is that we have this huge participatory feast where they all have to research a dish 
and prepare it and be able to talk about its history. And they're not graded on how well they cook it. Right. And it always turns out spectacular, oh. even if they're nervous. But it's really the research that goes into it. Yeah. I teach a course on uh, Russian culture and cuisine. So looking at Russian history through the prism of food. Yeah. And last semester, I did a course in comparative literature looking at the cookbook as a genre. Oh, wow. And we cool. read recipes as literature. Okay, I have to go back to my okay. undergraduate now. <laughs> <laughs> well, come soon oh, because wonderful. I'm phasing into retirement oh, now. Oh, yes. oh, how wonderful. What yeah. cool courses, though. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, so what do you, you know, when somebody picks up this copy of Fire Nest, what do you hope they're going to, the experience they're going to have? And, and what, what, do, what, do, what is your greatest hope? That people think my about? greatest hope is that they will find delight that they'll open themselves up to a new way of thinking that is not, oh, winter's coming, mm -hmm. and it's dark, and it's cold. But there's this wonderful Danish word, word called hygge, which is etymologically related to our word hug. They both okay. come from an old Norse root. And this idea in Danish doesn't have a direct translation. It's really about... Uh, comfort and warmth, but very importantly about companionship. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want people to experience is sitting together. I mean, you can enjoy the book in the summer too. It's, sure. There are a lot of summer recipes yeah, as well, right. but just to recognize that the North is this spectacularly beautiful place yeah. with gorgeous flavors and it's kind of wondrous. So I want to be able to carry people there. Sure. And why do you think that Norse cooking, or even different types of Scandinavian cooking, how, how come it hasn't become as popular as a lot of other cuisines here in the United States? Well, I think with the new Nordic, it's finally somewhat having its moment, mm -hmm. but that's really in the restaurant, uh, sure. you know, the very high-end right. restaurant. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to say is probably very glib, but I think that, you know, a prairie home companion, that sort of stereotype mm -hmm. of the dullard, Scandinavian who moved to Lake Wobegon mm -hmm. and just is, uh, there's nothing vibrant and sexy about it. Yeah. So I think that maybe right. that has contributed to a certain yeah. image, yeah. which actually isn't at all true. That's true. Although it's, you know, it's a funny <laughs> show. Yeah, that's right, but it isn't I mean, close. So anything you're working on now or any articles or anything? That oh, I'm to... always working yeah. on so many yeah, different yeah, things. Sure. I'm actually, I just finished an article for Eating Well magazine on Cuban food, which couldn't oh, be what? more distant wow, from sure. Scandinavian because uh, we were in Cuba and I was blown away by the flavors oh, there. Oh, wow. Wonderful, wonderful. So I end, end these interviews with a little quiz. So you know all the answers. Oh. So you know all the answers. Some some will be book related, some food related. So um, what was your favorite book as a child? My favorite book yeah, as a know? child, Anne of Green Gables. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, another cold, dark That's North right, Place, right. Prince Edward Island. Yeah, right. <laughs> but there's a lot of beauty there, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, do you remember something when you were at Vassar that you absolutely loved that stayed with you to this day? Oh, a beautiful pine tree. And I don't know what kind of pine, maybe it was hemlock now that I think <laughs> about it, but the way the leaves or the yeah. needles came down, the branches came yeah. down. And I sat, I would sit underneath it oh. on a warm afternoon oh, and read. Okay, and how about a book that you've been an evangelist for? Anything you've read your entire life that you could not tell enough people that they had to read? Oh, I would say The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, which I think is the greatest Russian novel of the 20th century uh -huh. about the devil coming to Moscow in the 1930s, a veiled look at Stalinist Stalin. Russia. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Um, how about, do you have a favorite cookbook, or is that asking too much for you to whittle it down oh, to a one? <laughs> that really depends on my mood. Okay, okay. Any, anyone you would go to for just comfort food? My husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He makes a mean... Does uh, he? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I was going to say my hot buttered rum when it's Ooh, cold. Oh, yeah. very But nice. he's a wonderful cook, okay. so. Okay. And how, who is your favorite Russian poet? Oh, you know, that's actually a hard question, okay. Becky, because the poet I wrote my dissertation mm -hmm. on, Nikolai Zabolotsky, should be my favorite Russian poet. Mm -hmm. But um, I think maybe at this point in my life, I am and drawn more to Osip Mandelstam. 
Okay. 20th okay. century again. Okay. Okay. And what is your favorite Russian dish? <gasps> My favorite Russian dish? Yeah. Um, you want something that is lavish or you want something that is comfort? Whatever you want to okay, say. Well, okay. Well, what I, because you have me thinking about literature okay. and being in your beautiful bookstore, yeah. what just came into my mind is this wonderful short story by Chekhov that's called The Siren. Okay. So the siren in the sense of a temptress, you right. know, not sure, the, sure. Yeah, the right, 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 right. And in it, he describes a meal that these uh, lawyers will get after they've finished writing up the court case. And the, uh, the crowning piece of that is the kulubiaka, which we tend to know as kulubiak, the, the French name, and it's a salmon pie. So it has either a puff pastry or like a brioche dough around oh, right, it. Sure. And you take beautiful salmon and also sturgeon if you can get it, mm -hmm. but salmon's sure. fine. Right. And you layer it with either rice or buckwheat, a lot of dill, mushrooms. Uh, you have a couple layers of blini there so that um, the texture is really good. Yeah. You bake it, and he describes it very oh, sensuously, yeah, right. erotically even. So yeah. I'm thinking of the kulubiak okay. of salmon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, how about um, a favorite book that you, you've taught with and when you're at Williams? So any, any book that you've used with your students that, have, that really stands out or even has a oh. great effect on them? Even. Yeah. Well, I think, again, I'm coming back to the poetry, and I think of Anna Akhmatova's Requiem. It's a series of poems that she wrote about the experience of living in a Stalinist Russian Russia when her husband had been imprisoned, her son had been mm -hmm. sent to the labor camps, and it's really uh, a gorgeous mother's plea, not just for her own family, but for Russia. Yeah. And anything you're reading now or read recently that you've loved? Yes, um, I am reading, and I have it right here. I've been lugging it all oh. over. It's 850 pages. It's Edward St. Aubin's, um, the Patrick Melrose novels. Okay. And I think that from everything I've been saying, you see, I have this very dark side because they're um, deeply distressing, but gorgeously, oh, gorgeously written. written. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am completely immersed in it. Okay. But I would like to just end on a, a brighter Okay. Note. <laughs> All right. I also just finished um, the first volume of Elena Ferranti's My oh, Brilliant Friend, yes, yes. Or of the first right, uh, right. book in her. Yeah. And those are much, and those are much, much more yeah. uplifting. Right, for sure. Well, Dara, thank you so much, and congratulations on Fire and Ice. I can't wait to start cooking from it myself. So thanks for sitting down and, and talking with me. Becky, thanks so much for having me and for being the impetus to uh, come back to my childhood stomping ground. It's Good. really a delight. What a delicious conversation with Dara Goldstein about her new cookbook. It's called Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking. Pick this one up to cook some delicious Nordic recipes for all the people in your life. Mm -hmm.